Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our talk on the business case for mental health in 2024. Um, we're so happy that you're here today with us. Um, and this talk is organized by Calm Collective and we're on a mission to normalize mental health in Asia. We do that within communities and workplaces through our content, programs and training. We work with corporate organizations to promote a culture of well-being at work and foster psychological safety for teams, as well as find a way to address stress and burnout compassionately. So if you're based in Singapore, our next event will be at Impact at Hong Lim Green, where we'll be having a short fireside chat with Jason Lai, who's a counsellor, and also a light version of Calm Circles, our peer support sharing circles, to learn, share and connect over how to thrive under pressure. I'm Cloris, your Senior Marketing Executive here at Calm Collective, and I manage all things marketing and I'll be your host for today. So today we'll be talking about the business case for mental health and why is it more important than ever. And I can't wait to dive deeper into this topic with two experts in the field, uh, Sabrina as well as Candice. So Sabrina, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure. Um, yeah, fun fact, by the way. So if you follow Calm Collective on our socials, um, Cloris is also the person behind a lot of our illustrations. Uh, and we're so lucky to have her with us on our team. Um, so hi, I'm everyone. I'm Sabrina. Um, I am the CEO of Calm Collective Asia. We were just talking behind the scenes and it's going to be our fourth year of doing this. Um, so as Cloris has shared, uh, we do a lot of work both in the community, partnering government organizations in Singapore, and also partnering um, global companies like Spotify, like Zulik Pharma, like BBH, um, regionally as, as well as across the world. So really excited to share more about the work that we do and also the insights that we've, we've been getting from across the various industries as well. So I'll hand it over to Candice. Hey, Sabrina. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Candace Schaefer. I am a clinical psychologist, and I have spent um, probably the last six to seven years working in the corporate setting. Um, I was originally a, a global resiliency program manager at Facebook, um, and then I moved to Twitter, where I was the director of global well-being. Uh, I miss Twitter. Um, and uh, then I was the uh, global head of uh, employee health and performance at Spring Health, which is an EAP um, that has expanded globally. Um, and now I am uh, in my own consulting firm um, called The Workplace Psychologist. Um, and we are great um, allies with Calm Collective. I've known Sabrina for many years. Um, and so it's great to be here and um, join the conversation around mental health in Asia. Thank you so much, Candice and Sabrina. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm super excited to learn from you both. You both have like such vast experiences in your day-to-day. -day. Um, before I get started on the conversation, I'd like to share a bit more of the context. Um, so if I could get um, Pavitra to help me share the screen real quick. And then, yeah, I would like to share some interesting insights that we've gotten from some research. All right, let's go. Okay, so over the last few years, as, as we all know, um, supporting mental health and well-being has become such a imperative at the workplace, right? But anecdotal evidence isn't enough. So what I want to do today is to bring you guys, um, bring you through some facts. So. Today, businesses are facing economic volatility, geopolitical instability, pandemic aftermath, and as well as organizational changes alongside accelerating digital transformation. These are all impacting the structures, processes, as well as our people. The current climate has made it has made financial well-being a prominent concern for both individuals and organizations. I'm sure everyone has also witnessed companies are implementing cost-cutting measures, and every dollar spent is now being scrutinized. So now, employees are increasingly worried about their job security, as well as the cost of living, which is now directly impacting their well-being. So let's take a quick look into the state of employees' well-being today. Based on what we've found, 51% 50, of APEC workers have reported feeling more sensitive to stress compared to 2022. And 45% of them have said that mental health is negatively impacting their productivity at work. So this means that employees are disengaged at work, 
and addressing these well-being concerns and improving engagement should be a top priority for businesses. Now, global statistics have shown that almost three out of five employees are quietly quitting. This means that they do the bare minimum and are psychologically disconnected from work. Almost one out of five employees are loudly quitting, and this means that employees are taking actions that are directly harmful to the organizations, which indicates a breach of trust between employees and the organization. In an ideal situation, we want to have engaged employees who find their work meaningful and feel connected to the team and the organization. So what happens when employees are disengaged? There will be issues such as presentism, absenteeism, and according to the WHO, the cost of mental health to business is 12 billion working days lost globally every year. And that's about 33 million years. And for comparison, dinosaurs were extinct 65 million years ago. <laughs> so these statistics was from um, 2022. So can you, can you imagine what the numbers look like today? After going through all these changes, um, such as layoffs, rising costs, and people who are still in the workforce are experiencing all these mental health struggles. So 47% of APEC employees are starting to feel burnout, and one in three of them have reported feeling a sense of helplessness. So when your employees are facing mental health challenges, they're, they are the employees who are facing mental health challenges are four times more likely than others to want to leave the organization. So the cost of this on your business is that the financial cost of replacing an employee can range from 1.5 to two times of their annual salary. So after sharing all these stats, um, I would like to hear from Candice and Sabrina. Um, what do you think, before, before we go into that question actually, what do you think of these stats? They sound about spot on to me. I don't know about you, Sabrina. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I mean, I think from what we've seen um, from various companies and speaking with them and even speaking with my friends, right? Like, I'm definitely observing that a lot more people are stressed or feeling overwhelmed. And, you know, Cloris, as you're sharing that, I think there was a stat on, um, you talked about dinosaurs, right? <laughs> and that just got me, to, got me thinking. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just really all about, we have to find a way um, as organizations, as individuals to evolve in a way that can help us prepare ourselves for the future or we die, right? Um, I mean, figuratively and literally, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to hear from you, Candice. Like, is this something that you're observing also yes. globally or? I I definitely would say in the Western side, uh, we're seeing this. I'm probably sure this is true to a certain extent on, on the uh, Eastern side, but uh the the retention uh of an employee i think is the most under uh, it, it it's overlooked i think by a lot of employers um and generations that are coming up now are starting to look at work differently um now millennials are the biggest uh generation in the workforce and now you know gen z will follow that and and others but the perspective on what work should be in one's life is changing drastically. Um, and so as a result, we're having a mismatch, I think, of values a lot of the times between senior leadership who tend to be older, which makes more sense, um, versus younger generations that are coming in and expecting something very different um, from the workforce uh, and their employers specifically. Yeah, and I, I think just, um, I, I was just looking at Clarissa's first slide of um, there's this meme where this dog is like you know everything's on fire yeah. so, um, so it's fine everything it's fine. everything's fine everything's <laughs> fine and the fire <laughs> and um, I feel like a lot of employees or people in general are kind of pressured to pretend that everything is okay and my observation is that I think to build on the whole idea of retention and how that's so important is that what's happening in the market right now is that we're every week we're seeing more news of layoffs um you know some of my friends a lot of millennials are getting laid off um and people are getting very disillusioned because the people who especially the people who stay behind they're losing their friends they're losing their managers they're losing faith in uh, their jobs right and i'm also hearing that 
the people who are left behind are taking on so much more work because of you know the layoffs or cost cutting measures um, that they themselves are overstretched to the point of burnout. And people are leaving jobs without a plan because they're like, I can't do this. Even though Mm -hmm. I wasn't laid off, I'm making the decision to resign and give myself a break. Yeah. And we're, I I don't know about um, uh, Asia as well, but I've been seeing in Europe and um, in the Americas, sabbaticals are becoming very, very popular um, where, you know what, I'm just taking off for a year (laughs) and that, that is so, so amazing. And I'm so happy to start seeing that. But how does that impact the workforce? And we're pushing people, I think, to a point where they know they need to be off of work for a year at a time. Yeah, actually, when I'm hearing that, Sabrina has also, we've been talking a lot about like sabbaticals and, and um, you know, what Sabrina is observing around her millennial friends. So there's really a lot of like burnout going on and that that's, that's what, Motiv- that's what's motivating people to take those sabbaticals but how do we how do we prevent that how do we help people work in a more sustainable way so then instead of like going on such long breaks like one year breaks which will then impact like a business workforce right so how do we then make sure that um you know what should companies do to support mental health at work so then people can show up more engage more productive instead of just saying okay i'm gonna quit today and like disappear for a year <laughs> Yeah, so maybe Sabrina, you can go, go first. I'm just like laughing because I've heard this from so many friends. And I mean, thanks for saying my millennial friends because um, you know, someone in this room is Gen Z. Thanks, <laughs> 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 I feel old. Um, yeah, so my boom friends are saying something else. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but on a serious note, um, you're right. I think what I'm observing with the millennial workforce is that you know, we, we've, this culture of, like, the hustle culture has been so ingrained in us, um, and when I had graduated from university back then, um, working overtime, working on weekends, it's normalized, right, and my generation is, has just been working our butts off, um, and to the point that we are, we realize that, oh, okay, now we're really overstretching ourselves, we're feeling burnt out, and when we're being laid off, then what was all of this for? So there's this huge reckoning of, I think as as Candice mentioned, like what's our relationship with work right now? And the role of the organi- organization is increasingly one where it has to take into consideration the relationship of the employee with the, with the work, with the organization, with the brand. And we're seeing that there's a rise in interest to help people find their purpose at work and also to create a more psychologically safe space so that people can be their full authentic selves at work without having to you know just hide everything and and to be in a culture of fear um so that's an observation that i've seen yeah so i'm I'm hearing that you know in order to to have employees show up more engaged and productive psychological safety is an important factor um, that's what I'm hearing from Sabrina. What about you, Candice? Um, I would say the thing that I've observed is really for workers to have a voice and a sense of autonomy in their in their role. So the workforce in itself, the kind of jobs that people have held over time have really changed from manual labor and um, manufacturing, like and those jobs still exist. But there's been a serious expansion to the knowledge um, economy um, and a lot more white collar type jobs where it is required for you to sit for long periods of time and do serious deep thinking and problem solving. And when you are trained to think like that, that applies to your employer and the workplace as well. And employees want to have a way for them to voice what is wrong, what they are feeling. Um, And the one thing I have tried to coach um, a lot of businesses on is just giving them a chance to be heard. You may not be able to fix everything, um, but giving them the space and validating those concerns is a major step in the right direction. And it, it can make a huge shift in the culture. Um, so 
I would say really thinking about employee autonomy. Um, do they have control over the work? And this will bring up kind of the whole return to work and being able to work flexibly and things like that. Well, that's definitely a big um, area, but also just how can employees voice their concerns to senior leadership? Is that a two-way conversation or is it a one-way? Right. Thank you so much for sharing, Candice. As, as you were sharing, I, I was listening, I was, I was hearing like the whole autonomy and flexibility and that's what the pandemic has brought out, right? Like people wanting to have more um, flexibility in their work, working from home so then they can spend more time with family or find ways to take care of their health um, even better. So this is what came out of the pandemic. So I wanted to ask Candice, with all your years of experience, how did organizations approach mental health pre-pandemic and with all the changes that we observe? Um, yeah, what, what are the changes? How, are mental, how, is, how is mental health being approached pre-pandemic? What is it like during the pandemic? And then what is it like? And then we've also, we've also, we've also, we've also seen, sorry, we've also seen what is it like after the pandemic? Yeah. 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 So before the pandemic, I think there was a big focus for attraction of talent. Uh, the economy was on the rise. Uh, things were going well. And when that tends to happen, there is a strong competition for, for talent. And I think the employer's perspective was, I need to offer these really amazing benefit programs which include mental health access of some kind. And this is also when we're seeing the startups uh, of um, EAP 2.0 um, really starting to um, innovate on how do we get more people access to mental health resources, but also just talking about well-being from uh, a broader standpoint, you know, financial well-being, physical well-being, but just how can we expand our benefits to attract the best talent? Now, Pandemic comes and there's a huge shock to the system around long-term isolation. What are the type of environments that people are working in? Because that is now their, their home environment. I remember um, when I was at Twitter at the time, we had people in Singapore um, that were in very, very small apartments. Um, and same thing in New York. It was also in Tokyo. Uh, we just... We're trying to figure out how to help people who are in long-term isolation. They didn't live with anybody and they are trying to get work done and they basically are in a one-room apartment. Uh, so the focus became more around how do we keep people stable? How do we keep them interacting? How do we give a sense of community when we don't go to a physical workplace anymore? Um, and at that time, remote working, I think, felt like a negative um, and then as time went on, this this shift uh, towards remote working, you know, it isn't so bad. We just have to figure out kind of a different way of working so that we still interact with people and still feel a sense of attachment to work. But the engagement, I think, is where you're seeing a, a real strong shift. Uh, people started really thinking about you know, how much time am I spending in a commute that I'm not spending now? And is this worth my mental health? And um, how much uh, do I really want to be dedicating my time to work? Some really kind of serious existential questions came up. And so uh, employers, I think, really upped their game in trying to bring mental health resources to the forefront, uh, especially for people who are struggling with loneliness and isolation or kind of the opposite, where we have, you know, multiple people in a house that um, maybe are not used to being around each other all the time. Or how do we keep people engaged at work? Um, and then post-pandemic, I think what we're seeing is kind of a continued push on those benefits. But as the economy has kind of softened and gone downhill a little bit, um, the uh, hunt for talent um, and the competition for talent has gone down. And so what we tend to see then is employers don't feel as much pressure to keep those benefits at top tier. Um, and so you're seeing kind of less of a focus on mental health, at least that's that's what I have been seeing. And it kind of just comes and goes with um, the market for the employer. If it's an employer's market, they don't have to put resources or as much time or money into mental health. And then when it's high um, competition, then the investment goes back up.
Yeah, yeah. I, I think thanks, Candice, for framing it that way as well. Because um, yeah, I totally agree with you. And uh, before Complex, if I was in the tech industry, right, and I did notice that wow, all these tech companies are they have all these sexy mental health benefits and a meditation room and things like that, right? And it was clearly a talent. It was a talent attraction strategy at that point. But then now there's lots of great talent on the market, and therefore. We have seen that across the board, across the world, um, companies have cut back on their mental health spending and these benefit spending, actually. Um, and you're right in saying that during the pandemic and also part of how Complective started pouring into the workplace well-being world is because companies realize that because everyone's so apart, it's really about driving engagement through driving engagement and belonging so that people can feel, yeah, feeling they can feel connected with their company and feel connected with their colleagues while they're forced apart, right? So the pandemic was all about how does well-being or mental health help with engagement? But then now, um, at least in this part of the world, we're seeing that mental health is seen as a way to help with retention, right? So everyone's stressed out. Clearly, everyone's performance is also being affected. And because the business has to care about the bottom line with such limited resources, how can we equip individual, uh, equip individuals with like the skill sets or the mindset that will help them come back to perform? Um, so it's, it's a huge shift that, that we've seen. And um, I think, Candice, you also mentioned about how, um, you know, our relationship with how we work, like whether it's, working from home, remote work, that can also really influence the way that we feel and our overall mental health. Yeah, those are really interesting points. And I'm kind of like hearing that companies are needing like a mental health strategy and that works now with with what's going on in the climate. So, and how does like, how should one create a mental health strategy that intersects well and or and goes well with like the overall business strategy? Um, it's really, I think, um, something to think about in terms of what are the KPIs of your business. Um, mental health ties into those KPIs, I guarantee that. Um, and so how do we look at a strategy and not a, a Band-Aid uh, yeah. as well, right? And so like, doing a one-off or um, some of, I don't want to call them fad benefits, but like watching the trends of your, your competing um, companies for talents and then saying, well, we need to offer that isn't a strategy. Um, that is simply just, you know, trying to appear like you are similar to, to your talent. A strategy involves looking at both internal and external programming that supports the employee as a whole. And I think employers struggle a bit with what does the internal side look like? Um, and because it's easy to hire a vendor um, to come in and bring those external programs in. Um, and so Calm Collective, you know, my own consulting uh, firm, we, we look at how do we coach um, employee, employers to create an ecosystem that supports your employee as a whole, especially from that mental health perspective. And that may mean looking at yourself, the, the organization and saying, what are we doing that's not supporting uh, the work-life balance, the mental health, um, whatever that might be, but ultimately going back to your KPIs and saying how do we expect this to change as a result of improved mental health and performance um, is a good way to connect um, those two. And there's a lot of different ways to do that because KPIs are different for each business, kind of depending on what they're in, but it's definitely a start. Now, one of the interesting things that we've seen um, in a client that we've worked with, so there's uh, so BBH, which is a creative agency. What they've realized is that uh, I mean, they do have an EAP, they do have training for the managers, which we we work together with uh, with them on. But what was actually a key thing that they did um, to help everyone's mental health was that the context here was that 
with the clients that, that we work with as a creative agency, oftentimes the unset expectation was for the turnaround time to be really quick, right? And so that gave the employees so much stress. They're like, oh, I got a client you know, message at 11 p.m. I got a reply by first thing in the morning. And that obviously affects the, the person's sleep and their ability to function for the rest of the day or even the rest of the week. So one of the things that they had implemented was actually to, to in every new client contract, they implemented a set of new service level agreements whereby the, the client should not be expecting an overnight turnaround time, right? So instead of getting an answer the first thing the next morning, let's wait 48 hours or two business days instead. And this really shifted the way that everyone felt on the team. And that obviously affected everyone's mental health, performance, and also um, they felt also a lot more um, appreciated at work because what the company did there in this case was that they really looked at the root causes of where um, the stresses are, right? Yeah. That's, that's something that I haven't, I mean, I've heard, because we've worked with PBH, but it's something that I haven't really heard from like other companies out there. And I think it's it's really important and it really shows that they care. And, you know, like you said, the sh- there's a shift in like their team. So then this contributes to like them being able to retain their team and, and maybe then attracting more talents, right? So I guess, can we like dive a bit deeper into like how well-being contributes to the retention and attraction of talents? Because in, in like the competitive job market and all, like the lack of investment in mental health means that you could be possibly losing out on like top candidates, right? So we've also seen like research saying that, you know, more than 80% of workers um, said that employer support for mental health is an important consideration when evaluating job opportunities. Yeah. So how can, I guess, how can, um, how can companies show that um, outward and also inwardly to make sure that they are retaining and attracting talents? Yeah, I think from an attraction perspective, um, I don't know about you, but my observation is that Gen Zs um, are finding work-life balance, um, quote-unquote, to be something that's really important for them. Um, And I think the... They're also asking for things like hybrid working. Um, I mean, I think going back to what Candace shared about autonomy, employee autonomy, um, and that goes back to trust. Does the organization trust their employees to um, work responsibly, to you know, um, yeah, to make sure that they they're delivering, um, even though there's no micromanagement. Um, so I think in terms of attraction um, and also retention right I one of the f- things I think about is that a lot of employees stay in a job because of their managers they join a job because of their managers and they also leave because of their managers mm-hmm. so um, one of the key levers that I mean Candice and I have talked about this extensively and I, I would love to hear from her as well is that it's really about how can we you know, how can we shift the culture both organize, from an organizational perspective, but also through the managers? Um, because the managers or the person who's leading a team ultimately shapes the culture of that team. And a team in a big organization, like Team A and Team B, can be have completely different cultures as well. So, I mean, I'd love to hear from Candice here. Yeah, agreed, agreed. When when I talk with employers about how do we look at assessing the health of their organization, it it is not just looking at the organization as a whole. It is looking at the micro ecosystems that exist within that company. And just as you were saying, Sabrina, one team manager can be leading a very strong, flourishing team and another manager might be not um, helping their team in terms of performance or it's feeling dysfunctional or it, it's just not moving in the direction that needs to be happening. And and the issue is, is like people managers are becoming such a strong component of both mental health and productivity for mm-hmm. all employees, but no one is trained on how to be a good manager. They're, when we are... Um, you know, hiring people, 
or it promoting them from within, we're usually promoting them because they have strong technical expertise, not necessarily because they are a strong people manager. Um, and some have never done people management before, but they want to move up the ladder. And usually that next, next rung is managing others. And so how are we preparing and training people to manage others, not necessarily uh, focusing on so much of the technical skill anymore. And sometimes that is a very tough transition for ICs or independent contributors to make that transition to a people manager and really think differently about interpersonal dynamics and, and how does that impact, you know, workplace hostility, um, toxic workplaces, uh, things like that. I've worked with a lot of managers who just don't know how to deal with interpersonal conflict or naturally kind of stay away from it when that is a part of your role is to get rid of like that, that toxic, um, uh, stag stagnant, uh, part that's causing so much friction in the, in the group. Um, so I would definitely <laughs> agree with you a lot on that, Sabrina. Yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, people, people managers play such an important role in someone's well being also, because like from my own experience, this is like the way that past managers have spoken, you know, it, they might, they might not think much of it, but you know the little nuances or like the passive aggressiveness of it can really, um, I guess break someone's mental health on a day to day, and you're like constantly worrying like, oh my god, did I do something wrong, or is it, or is it just that person? So I think it's also very important in the way that managers like learn the way to communicate, you know, and um, like how do you listen to your employees? How do you talk to them? How do you check in with them, and and how do you help address their struggles? So. I guess maybe this question is for Sabrina. Um, maybe you can share a bit more about like how we've helped companies, you know, train their managers in this area. Yeah, and I I, I want to hear from Candice as well. Um, because this is a whole big piece, right? And um, with regards to training managers, my observation has been a lot of the training, whatever is out there, is very um. It's very hard skills oriented. Like, how do we get everyone aligned? Uh, how do you run a meeting? How do you prioritize? Um, how do you um run a one on one? Like, no one on one. Not even that. How do you um, uh, do a performance review? That kind of thing. Um, but even before that, you uh, I think okay. So so just backtrack. The way that we work with managers um and how we started there is really because you know. Conflective, we're, we're all about normalizing mental health at work. And so traditionally, our approach has been, all right, so let's teach managers to understand what mental health is, what it's not, and what can we do if like someone in your team is facing a mental health challenge. But over the course of this work that we've done, we realized that the in order for a mental health conversation to take place, people need to feel psychologically safe enough to even um, get to that stage, right? So, um, for example, um, with what we've done with um, BBH and some other clients around the region is that we've started helping um, learning and development um, learning and development initiatives by creating like micro trainings around um, teaching managers to um, well, understand mental health, but also how do you how do you be better listeners as well, right? Um, we've also had like pockets of uh, teaching folks about what psychological uh, psychological safety is, and it's not. Um, and how do we teach managers to um, get a team feeling more included? How do we create a an environment that enables learning, enables contribution, and it enables the team to challenge and voice out concerns and make mistakes, right? So um, that's generally how we've been approaching it um, through um, creating like bespoke training or adjusting our mental health training that we do for the community to support managers. Because a lot of the work around mental health conversations and normalizing it is really to create a safe enough environment for people to be vulnerable. And the encouragement and the and what the thing that we do with managers here is that we encourage them to lead by example and be vulnerable themselves. So another thing that we've done with um, with Zulik Pharma um, for the region is that 
we actually hosted a, a, a talk with the CEO and he wanted to shift the culture to one that's a bit more compassionate in nature. So one that is able to listen to other people's perspectives, but also lend a helping hand if, uh, if the situation calls for it. So we see that, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's really about unlocking the managers, but also getting the C levels to take the first step and to say that, hey, this is something important because for managers to pay attention to this piece, um, you know, they are of, they're handling so many things as it, as it is. They're handling the interpersonal dynamics, but they're also handling themselves and also being accountable for the team. So oftentimes when we do like, when we want to plan a manager training, it's hard for managers to even show up because they're like, wait a minute, I got all these things to do. I got to go for a client meeting. I got to do this report by a certain deadline. So someone on top, like at the C-level or the managing director or, or whoever the senior stakeholder is, they need to also give permission to the rest of the managers in the, in the company to make time for this kind of training as well. So that's uh, the two ways that we look at it. How do we empower the managers and how do we enable the leaders to, to make this happen for everyone else? Basically and like working with managers, uh, leaders actually to set the tone, to kind of like bring them forward so then they can role model. Mm. Um, and show that the import that's the importance to make it a priority we, to make it a yeah. priority because I like as a manager and I'm a manager as well right <laughs> of, of you <laughs> but, um <laughs> it's hard to 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 balance so many priorities and like you know the word priority is not meant to handle like it's just one priority mm. that's how it's supposed to be but I think in the current uh environment there's so many things to juggle so it's it's hard yeah and I mean, from my experience working with um, Sabrina, I think you've done a really good job in, you know, role modeling and being vulnerable um, with the team and saying that, okay, this is something that I'm struggling with. Um, I need help. Can you guys help me? So then that actually gives us the opportunity and opens, opens the door for us to also say like, I'm not so sure about this and I think I need your input. Is it okay if you help me? Yeah, so then when we all can come together and work um, in a way and like collaborate, it really um, gives... Uh, gives chance to like innovate better, work on it, become more productive at the end of the day. Yeah, so kind of like going back to like the business case, right? How how can businesses measure the ROI of like investing mental health? Or like, yeah, maybe that first and then I have like a follow-up question on that. Maybe Candice. Oh, Candice. Yeah. So I get this question a lot. Um how do you measure the effectiveness of a well-being intervention? How do I show the ROI? And it's really going to come down to what does your business care about? Um, and that will be your metric. Um, for some businesses, it is retention um, slash attrition. For other businesses, they are looking to decrease the amount of absentee workdays um, and increase uh, revenue um, by... Uh, increasing engagement. Um, another metric might be uh, the employee engagement surveys that go out once a quarter or once a half or once a year and seeing the improvement in those scores. Um, so it's, it's really up to the organization as to where they want to see that ROI. I would just encourage all employers when they're coming up with this to make sure that there is a linear connection um, that we don't just pick a, a metric that doesn't really, that isn't going to show that, that impact. Um, so, uh, that would be, uh, kind of my suggestion. Uh, I've also seen, um, like in the United States, since employers provide health insurance for, uh, employees, uh, they look at cost of healthcare claims, uh, as well, because in younger populations, um, when I was at Twitter and Facebook, mental health was the either the first or the second most costly um, mental medical claim that will come through. Um, and so seeing decreases in those claims was another example. Right. Okay. So, you know, because we are like measuring all these and these are all like, like very much data driven. Um, I wanted to also ask Sabrina um, on like the more human side of things, right? you know, our feelings and, and all that. How how can I guess like a team manager, uh, what can they do to find out 
if their employees are like surviving and thriving. Surviving or thriving? I mean, I think um, a very common tool that companies have relied on is um, is clearly the the pulse surveys, right? And these usually go out on a quarterly basis. Um, I was just having a chat <laughs> literally last week with um with with someone um who who manages these, and what they said was that yes, it goes out on a quarterly basis. So at the end of March, we receive the result. I mean, at, at the start of April, we receive the results. We take a month to analyze it. And then in May, we do something about it. But then by then, things may have changed completely. Mm. So I I think pulse surveys are helpful to some extent. But, you know, a lot of things in this world um, are happening very reactively right now. For example, layoffs may happen next week. Um, a war may happen, right? And that, like, events like that can significantly shift the mood. And so a pulse survey will not, adequately reflect what the real sentiment is um and like you know the pandemic happened overnight so the pulse a pulse survey from the week before versus right after that completely different right so i think what um companies or, or teams need to do is really have more better one-on-ones or have uh, so there's this whole wave of uh, micro coaching also as a concept um, so how do we enable managers, leaders to coach their teams in a way that's, you know, just, you know, it could be in micro moments of 10, 15 minutes to just check in with their teams and see, hey, you know, get, let's get a straw poll. How are we feeling right now? And then just continuously calibrate based on how the team is feeling. Um, and also, how can we make use of one-on-ones or how, how do we reframe our um perspective on what one-on-ones are supposed to be so you know traditionally a one-on-one happens like i don't know at once a month every two weeks and that's like one hour of dedicated time or half an hour of dedicated time um and i think it's really unrealistic for us to expect an employee to just say okay for the past two weeks since i last saw you these are all my issues and let's troubleshoot and let's address it and let's talk about me about my feelings from the last two weeks Mm -hmm. um so instead of having those kind of like you know um, staggered one-on-ones how can we enable managers to check in with their teams more regularly and in a way that is more I think okay it's okay to have it more reactively in nature as well if you see someone struggling like for example between like with Chloris if I'm see if I see Chloris like oh you're doing something uh, something new it's a new task shall we check in more often um, and we don't even need a whole hour to to talk about it we just need 10 minutes how are you feeling right now um, and how can I support you, right? Um, or can I give you some feedback as well? So, you know, in that 10 minutes of um, touch point with an employee, can you check in with how they're feeling? Can you help troubleshoot anything on the spot? And can you share any feedback and also receive feedback as a manager? Um, so I think, um, in short, the answer is really to be a lot more intentional about how we interact with our employees and as managers let's equip ourselves with those tools and frameworks to have very high impact low touch points you know like micro touch points um so that's my take on it um yeah candace i would love to hear from you as well i mean just throwing it over (laughs) yeah i to to kind of like elaborate on your point a little bit and what i've done for manager trainings in the past is really try to focus on coaching as a skill that needs to be practiced and learned um, because coaching is not always easy. Uh, and, and if we look at like a, a situational leadership model, for example, um, we have four quadrants where we might direct somebody, um, basically telling them exactly what to do. We might delegate to somebody because we know they have the skill set and they don't need to be told how to do something. Um, And then we may have um, someone that needs coaching who they have some idea of what they're doing, but they need that that hands on um, approach or just some some guidance, not necessarily being told how to do it um, or what to do. Uh, but the guidance and the support that that will unlock that person's potential. And so coaching in itself, I think, is a valuable um, training for managers to have and brush up on 
um, as a way to both support and guide, not necessarily kind of the, the older school way of thinking, which is I'm a manager and I tell so-and-so what to do and they do it. Yeah, and, and I think just to add on quickly, like um, I don't I can't remember the research, but um, it does show that the younger workforce is also really values feedback and learning and growth opportunities within an organization is very highly valued right now, com even compared to salary. So a lot of younger folks are looking for ways to grow and therefore that feedback shared or that coaching being done is super valuable. Yes. And and the one to, to go back on that too, like the one stress point that I've seen consistently across every organization I've worked in for employees is I don't know how I'm doing mm -hmm. and I get no feedback and I feel like I could be fired tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know how I'm doing. And that uncertainty puts your employee in a sense of constant anxiety of, am I doing enough? Am I performing well enough? Um, and I think sometimes employers kind of look at employees the other way, like, oh, they're trying to be lazy or they don't care or they're disengaged when really I think the majority are in the opposite where it's like, please tell me how I'm doing because a one a once a year performance review is not frequent enough. And mm -hmm. when we talk about like flow states um, where you really are enjoying and engaging with your work that comes from constant feedback. Uh, so you're absolutely right in saying younger generations want more. Yeah, no, and I think just there's like so much to say, so much to say, but, um, you know, and in that anxious state, which I think a lot of people are, I mean, seemingly the stats do show that a lot of people are in this state of anxiety right now. Um, you know, we're all just human beings at the end of the day. And um, in that state of anxiety, our bodies will tell us to just freeze or to flight, fight. And that's the other like fawn, fawn response, like beg, please keep me in my job, right? And and all, obviously all of this is affecting our performance, which is, you know, um, not what businesses want. So I think what businesses are asking themselves or companies in general, it's really about how do we get people to feel safe amidst all of this change and uncertainty and even the companies can't um, assure, like can't like even managers or leaders can't be sure about a lot of things right now, right? But how do we keep people still feeling safe enough so that they can show up in a way that's present and that enables them to perform and, and do their work, right? Let's not even get, talk about like getting into a flow state at, the, at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, I can attest to, you know, the whole like younger generations wanting to have like the whole um growth and feedback because I, 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 I am like that also and I always ask Sabrina for feedback and that really helps me to understand how I'm performing where I'm at and then, you know, once I know, once I'm sure, I don't feel anxious about it and I can like keep on working on that. Um, and also, I guess, you know, with all, with all that we've discussed, how, how can managers um, build that safety? How can they create that environment? But I, I also want to kind of direct this to another point, which is like, how can they also then ensure that, you know, what they're doing is inclusive and it addresses the diverse needs of their workforce? Because we, we all work in a different way. Um, yeah, and, you know, in APEC, the people that we are dealing with are so vastly different and and that could be said the same for um, your environment as well, like Candace in the United States. Yeah, how do companies ensure that, you know, that they are building resilience among their employees and how do they make sure that it's in an inclusive way that, you know, it addresses all the diverse needs? Um. So one example that I can think of, I mean, there's lots of different ways to do this and involving um, your DEI teams is super, super important. Um, so well-being, DEI, I feel like we go hand in hand. Um, but uh, one example that I have seen in other companies I've been at is really having a structured conversation and uh, uh, ways of working. Uh, document of saying, you know, this is how I like to be communicated with. 
this is how I tend to work, uh, or these are the hours that I need to work. And this, these are the times I need to pick my kid up from school. Um, or, uh, when I'm having a problem, this is how I like to be coached. Um, so really kind of having the right questions so that we're supporting the individual, um, and in how they work best. Uh, so that I, I have seen is, is a really great way of, of, um, fostering that independence, but at the same time, recognizing individuality. I really like that. Um, so I think one of the observations I've had around DEI initiatives, um, you know, across the different organizations is that there's this tendency of like, okay, you know, we're going to do an, we're going to bring an, the, uh, we're going to bring about an, a DEI initiative for the company. Let's start an employee resource group for women, for Black people, for Muslims, right? For whatever, uh, LGBT, uh, QIA+, right? And um, it's, I mean, I, I, I can get on board with it because there are some similar uh, or common experiences that people, like say, for example, women folk um, uh, have gone through, right? Like microaggressions from from men or from whatever, right? We can talk about that as a collective segment. Um, but what I read, uh, but what I've observed is that there there is the danger or the fine line of tipping over to the other end where it creates more divisions rather than inclusion, right? And that um and that emphasis on like similarities. Um, it, it it can become like a oh in our our we women are like this unlike you men that can that can happen right um, so I do like that Candice you brought in the idea of that working guide and looking at the individual as unique because um, we're all women here and we may all have very different experiences um, and as a manager as a colleague you want to understand the diverse experiences that your team member is bringing. Um, and a lot of the things are not surface level, right? Like I'm an introvert. I have ADD. I have a certain, you know, organized chaotic way of working. Um, and that's something that I'm aware of. And I tell my team, um, but then you're like, just because Clarice is a woman, she's not, you know, she may not, work, she may work very differently. Um, so I do like that, um, that that concept or that framing of looking at the individual as a unique person um, and inviting that self-awareness um, for the person and also for the team to acknowledge the um, the ways of working that the new team member or a team member is bringing to the, the team. Um, and I think the other part about these ERGs, um, the employee resource groups, I think I do appreciate them also because they also have served as a platform for people to have a voice. Um, and I think we mentioned that upfront earlier on around how um, these, so we've been doing these community circles for various companies, uh, for different ERGs. And we have found that within an organization, it does help to have a safe space to know that I have some like-minded or like-identified people that I can reflect on my my um on my experience with so i, I do see a, a comment in the chat and it's also about um addressing intersectionality it's not just about i belong to this community and this community but not that right so i think yeah thanks uh, kavita for sharing in the chat yeah we all kind of like sit in different communities at the same time you know like maybe as a woman and as someone with like for example um uh, Sabrina, you say you have ADD, then maybe there's someone who's neurodiversity, you know, a guy, yeah. But also with ADD, then we all like just kind of like. Well, even us, um, yeah. even uh, when I've had these discussions around mental health, like I always caution individuals who have a certain condition, like depression or ADHD or things like that. Like your experience of depression or ADHD may be completely different from another person who has. Um, ADHD or depression. Um, so just be cautious in making the assumption that, oh, this person knows exactly what, you know, I'm going through. And then I won't tell them 
all of these intricacies about my experience because they just know Mm -mm. we have to continue sharing how that affects you as an individual and I, I i see i see a lot of value in having all this like like ergs or like peer support groups you know in the, the community it really helps us find um realize that we're not alone and we can all always learn share you know connect with everyone else who have same but different experiences yeah i'm also wondering okay i'm very aware of time we have like three minutes left but I have this one question um with you guys's experience has there been any challenges that companies face when they are implementing well-being initiatives and how do they overcome them the biggest challenge I see is I don't have time for this I don't have time <laughs> uh. yeah for employees um, to say I don't have time or even managers like just I do not have time. Um, and so how, how do you encourage in, in the organization that it is important to value well-being as a part of your performance and your time um, and a lot that. Um, and so uh, things that I have thrown this out to um, organizations I've worked with before, but I've never gotten enough traction on it to actually make a kind of KPI for managers, for example, that looks at, I spend, you know, this much time dedicated to my professional development or the professional development of my, my direct reports. Like, how do we make that a part of the culture that it becomes just as important as the performance of doing your day-to-day -day job that brings in revenue, quote unquote, you know, that this doesn't. Yeah. And I think what goes hand in hand is also the challenge of getting senior leadership buy-in, whether it's to champion the cause or the initiatives, because, you know, I mean, like at least in Singapore or Asia, it's a very collectivistic um, society, we want to see the leader do it, then we'll all do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also to unlock initiatives, to change policies, to um, maybe bring in a consultant like Candice to help out, you know, unlock the budget. Just having enough senior leadership buy-in um, will make a huge difference to give permission to the managers and the employees to make time for it. So that's a big challenge here. Okay. Um, we have I have one last question, I guess, to kind of like wrap up the this whole conversation. Um, maybe you know, most of the people here who are joining us already have like interest in mental health and supporting mental health at work. How can they sustain and continuously improve their effort in promoting workplace well-being over the long term? Don't Candace? make it a trend, don't make it a fad. Don't, yeah, don't make it a <laughs> like, try, don't make it a fast. So like, how do you do that? And that is um, going back to kind of one of the things I mentioned earlier is weaving it into the 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 company itself. The, the strategy, the HR policies, everything needs to show the reflection. And, and so, and, and my friends in DEI will say the same thing. Like, this is not something that you just bring in and do it once a month and we have well-being month. Um, like I've, I've done those things and those are great. They help revitalize. But if you want long-term lasting effects, there needs to be components of your strategy woven into every part of the business and there has to be buy-in at every level. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think to... To start something is easy, but to sustain it is not, right? Because um, I think what we've seen from the pandemic is that it's been very trendy. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, people do say that, like, upfront, yeah, this well-being or mental health thing is really uh, trending right now. Like, we should do something about it, <gasps> you know? Oh, no. <laughs> um, but so I think um, it's a couple of things, right? It's about shifting the culture, both top-down and bottom-up. And I mean, we've, we've talked about top down, what the leaders can do, what managers can do, but we've also seen companies like Spotify, for instance, have a dedicated mental health initiative that brings in people who are from all the different uh, business units, from all the different levels of uh, the organization and across countries, right? 
so activating bottom up um, um, advocacy for mental health can also go a long way in helping to shift the culture. Um, and the other part of it is also around constant, like continual measurement of how the program is doing, whether it's quantitatively or qualitatively. If you're able to keep on showing or continually showing, um, continually show the impact that the initiatives are making, then this will help to also build the case for mental health within your organization. So yeah, everything. Do everything. Do everything. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for sharing all that. Um, I guess, yeah, that's all the time that you have for today. So thank you again, Sabrina and Candice, for such an insightful session. And all of you who showed up today, and I hope this session has inspired you, you know, to take action, whether to start or to continue promoting mental health and well-being at work. So um, if you guys are interested to find out more about how we can help your company's mental well-being initiative, you can scan the QR code there. We can visit our website. Um, yeah, so my colleague Pavitra has dropped the link there. And also another reminder that we have um, our next in-person event um, based in, for those of you who are based in Singapore, um, we are hosting our next Calm Circles at Impact at Hong Lim Green. So we'll be having our Calm Circles live and we'll be talking about how to thrive under pressure and you can sign up um, in the link in the chat as well. Yeah, so, um, and if you guys have any questions um, that maybe we haven't addressed today, feel free to drop us an email over at hello at comcollective.asia. Yeah, and that's all. Yeah, any last <laughs> words from Sabrina or Candice? Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was going to say, for those of you who are working to implement anything like this in your organizations, just know, I mean, it. the journey is always 1% done. <laughs> Um, and uh, it's all the small wins that, that happen over a period of time. It's probably never going to feel like it's a big, big win, but when you, when you do get that momentum going, it's, it's amazing. So I just want to shout out there to say, you know, keep it up. You're doing important work. Yeah. Just by showing up today and getting some inspiration and insights. Um, thank you for, for dedicating that time um, to learn with us, learn from us and, Hopefully, yeah, reflect on how you can influence mental health at your workplace um, in whatever position you're in. Yeah. yeah. And for those of you who actually signed up on our link, so we'll share the recording of this as well as the copy of the slides that we shared earlier. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, have a great day, everyone. <laughs> Go. <on. laughs>